Good morning to everybody. My name is Matteo Dell'Amico and I am the founder of Water Jade. It is a pleasure for me to be invited in your prestigious event. I'm going to talk to you about a new technology with, that we call the digital twin of the catchment that can be applied to monitor water resources at catchment scale. First of all, who we are, we are a company located in uh, it northern Italy, in Trento, and uh, we put together horizontal skills in remote sensing, GIS, mathematical and physical modeling, but applied to the vertical of water from uh, meteorological and snow monitoring to extreme events alerts. We have experience in working with hydropower companies, uh, water utilities, and uh, public agencies. How much water is in the catchment and when will it become available? Will I be subject to an extreme event? These are the questions that most water managers are asking to comply with water supply. And these questions are becoming even more um, <clears throat> critical because of two major drivers. Climate change that is making water availability more discontinuous and extreme and the topic of sustainability and, for instance, the EU taxonomy that is making water reporting compulsory and qualifying. According to our experience, uh, we see that there is, uh, uh, the water is uh, very well uh, monitored and optimized, let's say, in the plants. For instance, if we look at the water utilities from the plant to the households. But we see that the water in the environment is generally overlooked by, by industries that tend to use uh, ready-to-use models and history, historical based predictions with a poor planning and poor accuracy. Why is it so? But first of all, if we take, uh, let's say, kind of a dis statistical distribution of historical data, we might find a mean value and, uh, a, a, and a variance. Uh, what is doing climate change is somehow compressing the curve and enlarging the variance so that it's much more likely to, to shift from one extreme to the other. So from drought events to flood events. So climate change is not actually making water resources more scarce, at least at, at, according to our knowledge it's making water resources more discontinuous. And, it's, and this has the disadvantage that we are more likely to service interruptions, penalties, overflow, and damages. Well, I could say, okay, how can we do this? We could use the satellite. Yes, I would say satellite data are for sure interesting. But if you look at this, uh, <clears throat> at this image, they just put one part of the of, of the story and uh, so does in situ data or numerical weather predictions so <clears throat> looking at just one source of data is probably not the best solution at the same time may, many people tend to use to look at their own data for instance uh, the data of an intake of, of a reservoir or a spring if they do have data on springs or data on the level of lakes, or data on the groundwater, for instance, the level of the water table in it well. But if you just look at one source of data without looking at the whole catchment area, you might not be able to explain or to, uh, let's say, to, to explain the, the, the variability or the seasonality of your, of your data. So in our... Uh, experience the solution is looking at the whole catchment so this is why we have developed this technology that we call the digital twin of the catchment where we look at the whole catchment what what is happening there from the top of the mountain where you might have snow for instance down to the water table and in order to do so we use weather forecasts satellite data and in situ data putting together physical models and machine learning so with the objective to digitize all the components of the water cycle and provide accurate forecast of water inflow to the point of interest. How does it work? 
let's imagine a natural catchment without without any 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 hydraulic works. The first thing that we do is that we want to find the geometry of the system, so the catchment geomorphology, and see if there is a let's say some hydraulic works like pipeline etc that are taking the water. So this is the first phase where we want to subdivide the catchment into subcatchment or subbasins and characterize the written word network. Then the second step is to collect the data. So we collect meteor data, observations of water and satellite data in order to understand if there is an intake of water, if there is a dam and a reservoir, to see the direct basins, the connected basin, and also to identify possible sources of data like in-situ stations, meteor stations, or water observation. Finally, we want to model, so let's say reconstruct the, the, the water availability in the catchment, but we have to choose the right model to do so and to calibrate the model. And there are physical models, that like lamped models, semi-distributed models, distributed models, or statistical models like downscaling procedures, weather generator, forecast models. So, and also we have to understand what kind of phenomena are we likely to describe? Is it a snow present, or just interested in the runoff, in evapotranspiration, and so on? So we need to decide the model, and the the final configuration of the digital twin could be a system that puts together the various hydrological response units, so dividing the catchment into sub bases and taking into account the effect provided by the hydraulic works, so the pipes, the conduits, the reservoirs, the intakes, and so on. And looking also what happens in terms of phenomenology at the top of the mountain, probably there might be seasonal snow cover. So after that, it might happen that there are missing data. How do we do if the data are missing? Well, we can use Explore the Satellite. In this image, you see a river section where, thanks to the use of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, we can count the pixels that are wet and the pixels that are dry along uh, a river outlet. And so in the low regime, there are a few pixels that are wet, but in the high regime, there are much more pixels that are wet. So just making a calculation of the, 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 the water cover area, we might like to, to find a, a trajectory, a dynamics of the water in the river and so reconstruct a likely uh, target uh, dynamics of the, of the water in that section just using satellite data. So final, we have a calibrated model that takes into account the meteo meteo data, physical models, machine learning, and uh, with a metrics of, let's say, uh, of uh, reconstruction that is uh, sufficiently uh, accurate for our purpose. In this plot, you, you see the KGE, which is a, a metric used in hydrology, or the R square that are looking at how we are, in this case, reconstructed the level of the reservoir. Once we have the calibrated model, we can feed the model with forecast services. In order to do so, it's very important to understand what is the objective of the forecast. Are we interested in flood? If yes, then we want to feed the, date, the model with short-term predictions like weather forecast for the next 72 hours and in order to see how the water will evolve in the next hours at very high resolution. Are we interested in drought conditions? So, for instance, we do have to manage a reservoir or, or a water table. Then we, as the drought is commanded by um, a, a slow, a slow uh, time of response, so high inertia, we can feed the model with a seasonal forecast with six months ahead and a monthly update. And these data are available from the Copernicus data store. 
Are we, on the other hand, interested in see how the water resources are evolving in the next years or in the next decades according to climate change scenario? Maybe because we need to revamp a plant or maybe because we want to build a new plant for water abstraction or maybe in a context on landscape, we want to do nature-based solution, change the shape of some uh, parts of the landscape. Then we want to fill the model with a climate change scenario and see what happens in the next 30 years. So if we go back to the initial question of this water manager, how much water is in the catchment? When will it become available? Then the answer that we are want to like to provide to this manager is a dashboard that he can uh, uh, access and see what reporting, what monitoring, what a forecast, what an optimization and extreme events alerts. So let's see some examples. And here we are in a, in a basin located in northern Italy, not far from Venice, near the first uh, parts of the Alps. You can see the red spot here in the province of Vicenza. And here you can see the catchments that we have been asked to analyze. And we have closed, let's say, the catchment area in a point where we do have data on a hydrometer. So water gauge, a water gauge historical data. The first thing that we have done is to calibrate the snow model because uh, in the catchment here, the snow is very important. So you see a timeline from 2012, uh, 2013 and so on, where we have calibrated the snow on various catchments. Then we have done the calibration of the physical model for, for the water discharge. So we did have the validation or say the, the, the target uh, measured water discharge and we wanted to see, uh, to see if the model could reconstruct. And we had some difficulties here because of karst effects. So the water was not just going uh, into runoff or was very much infiltrating. So in order to, do, to improve the calibration metrics, we have added a layer of machine learning after the physical models. And in this case, the metrics, the R square is very much improved uh, to, to reach almost 0 0.9 at a, a monthly scale. Then we have fed the model with climate projections from uh, up to 2050. So for the next three decades, as you can see on the top, the temperature is very likely to increase in the, in the catchments. You can see the three uh, climate projections, scenario 8.5, 4.5, and 2.6. So the, 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 the temperature is very likely to increase, but the, the, the precipitation is very noisy. There is not a, a, a signal for precipitation increase or decrease. So we applied these uh, scenarios to the model, and the first thing that we had have looked is the snow melt. So just imagine a catchment at a low elevation below 900 meters. This is the historical snow melt we were receiving in along the months. For instance, you can see here January, February, March. So in March, we were very likely to have a, a high snow melt ratio. But if you see here the projections, we see that in January it's more or less the same, but in February is almost almost half. There's no melt, and in March is zero. At uh, let's say medium uh, uh, ranges of elevation, here we always have the historical data, and this is the projection. So because of the temperature increase, we are very likely to decrease to increase in February, but very much decrease in March. And in April, we won't have any more water from snow melt. And the same happens in the, in the higher elevation basins. What is the effect of the snow? The, the effect of the snow is that this is the, <clears throat> let's say, um, uh, a plot that says that provides the various 
months, so January, February, etc. And you can see here that uh, we are likely to experience a lower water regime in April, May, June, and July because of the effect of the, snow, the decreased snow melt. And we are likely to, to, to experience lower inflow, lower water, when it is needed for irrigation, so during the summer. If we look at the water table here, we can see that we have found a very high correlation between the water table depth in July, you can see here in this y-axis, and there's no water equivalent in the basin in April. So we have learned that the water table is not commented or dominated by precipitation, but it is dominated by the snow. So if we do monitor the snow in April, we are very likely to have a, a, an indication on how the water table is going to evolve during the summer. So the water utility in this case asked us, could you please provide a monitoring or a forecasting service? And this is what we have done so far. So it is possible to select the basin of interest and we feed the model with seasonal forecast that we take from ECMWF, so the European uh, Meteo Center, and this uh, <coughs> ECMWF are treated according to stochastic approach with quantiles, so we have the 20th quantile, the 50th quantile or the 80th quantile. And here we can provide a forecast for the next months, putting together the historical mean as a terms of reference and the, the forecast that the model is giving, taking into account the snow present in the catchment and the, project, the prediction of the precipitation. In this case, the advantage for the utility is that they can strat have a better strategy on how the things are going to evolve. They can plan the reservoir and, and so on. But other advantages are available with this technology. So it is possible to do a status quo assessment on the recharge time of water. It is possible to do strategical analysis for interventions. And also, it is possible to have alerts for drought and flood, and also a report on, uh, on the water availability and the water stress for, for the ESG reporting, for instance. So I'm going to conclude. <clears throat> Let's imagine that we have a start. We are here as, as a point. And we want to go towards a sustainability goal or climate resilience goal, okay? It is possible to face this path along various, let's say, steps. The first step that I would, <coughs> that I would recommend is the status quo assessment. So to calibrate the digital twin, the model, in order to understand how the water cycle works in the catchment. And then it is possible to see whether we want to go towards the climate change projections to plant revamping to see what if analysis for the next decades, or we can go to a, a operational a maintenance, let's say, approach in order to fill the model with seasonal forecast or short term for forecast in order to have drought alert or flood alert. So it's possible to decide, but the first thing that I would recommend to do is a first analysis on how the catchment is behaving. This is all from my side. It was a pleasure to be here and I look forward to receive your questions. Best, best regards. My question is how big should be the catchment? Because you know, if you have river basin, you can divide it according to several small rivers and you can get smaller and smaller catchment and probably you would not get this some comprehensive uh, picture. So how big should be the catchment for your analysis to, to make a sense sort of? And 
if you want to calibrate your model for another catchment, what would be the input data uh, you would need? Yes, <clears throat> hello. I, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> uh, thank you for your question. I agree that the smaller the catchment, the most noise, the higher the noise you have in the data. But it is also true that it is in the small catchments where the, the, there is a high interest you now because you have maybe a point of interest there. So uh, I would say that uh, with, with our modeling approach, I would say that uh, we uh, normally consider catchments like high, bigger than one to three square kilometers. I would say I wouldn't go below one kilo, one or two square kilometers for the catchment, because probably in that case the the noise is too high. And uh, what about the data? <clears throat> the data um, sometimes when you have smaller catchments, you don't have um, a lot of data, because probably it was not necessary to install any sensor because of uh, 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 you know absence of sensors. And so my recommendation would be to go downstream and to find a point where the, the water is monitored, maybe with an hydrometer. So maybe you are interested in, the, in a catchment which is five, six, 10 square kilometers but the station with the data maybe is 15 kilometers downstream. Let's make this example. So you close the system there. So the catchment would, to be modeled, would be maybe 200 square kilometers. Then you close the system there. You look at the, the mass conservation there. And then with this information, you go back to your point of interest and you extract from the model the information on your catchment. So in case of absence of data, this is the approach that I would recommend. And uh, so the advantage of this is that in any case, you would have mass conservation in uh, information that the model gives you all, also in absence of data. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the answer. Are there any other questions? Also, Thomas Brunner, who is online with us. Thomas, if you wish, you can also ask Matteo. <clears throat> Nobody has any questions, but I have made some notes. So maybe I would like to ask first, uh, because your presentation was really impressive, what all you can calculate and predict. I really enjoyed. And uh, so my first question would be, all the models that you are using for your predictions, are they, are they uh, developed by your team or do you use any, any commercial or publicly available software? Um, uh, good question. So um, during my research, let's say, <clears throat> during my PhD, for instance, I have been working and with models in the university where I have been uh, studying. And there I had the chance to, to, to experience into coding and modeling. Uh, and, uh, but, and so I started with models that were developed initially by the university. These models are all open source. Uh, so we started from something that had a kind of a scientific reference, a scientific you know, methodology. But of course, these models that come from the university have the disadvantage that they are not engineered to do, uh, you know, a ser a continuous service. So they're not engineered to, to do, say, operational services. They are, have been developed to, for doing research, mostly. 
like the PhD thesis of one person, the master thesis of another person, and so on, the publication, the project. And so what we have done so far is to engineer, to do all the pre-processing, the data processing, the data archive, <clears throat> the, and the, the, you know, all the, the, the dashboard, all the data flow in order to use these models, but for operational purposes. It happened, it happened that we have been using also commercial software, serve, uh, softwares like Hack HMS, for instance, for the hydrology or other type of uh, commercial services for, for, and so <clears throat> it really dep depends on uh, the type of uh, service that has to be implemented and uh, the target user, because if the user has the curiosity, so to say, the curiosity to put the hands into the model, then we might develop a project for this purpose. But if the, the user is just interested in the results, then we would just provide uh, the, the dashboard with the results. <clears throat> so the commercial service, I would say, is... Um, is interesting when uh, when the user wants to have to be kind of autonomous and so we provide these commercial services uh, with a commercial software in order to to provide any uh, a, a service that is <clears throat> can be used by the the user himself okay thanks very much i have similar experience with uh, models that uh, have been developed at the university so thanks for that and maybe one last question still no other questions because i have really several of them but i will stop now but the last question is <clears throat> uh, if it is possible for you to maybe estimate somehow um maybe say some percentage or i don't know how much in your work in general how much you rely on physical based models uh, with when compared to the statistical ones yes uh, i would say that uh, nowadays uh, i think uh, machine learning artificial inf intelligence has become a buzzword no everybody is using this you know also to convince the people <laughs> of the quality because they say, I'm using machine learning. <clears throat> I still am, have the idea and the experience, so to say, that the water follows the physics. The water follows the gravity. <laughs> and uh, so um, so in our, in our case, in hydrology, but I say many environmental sciences, the physics is important. The physics is, you cannot exclude the physics. Uh, this is my piece of experience. But it is also true that if you just use physical models, you might run into problems of data scarcity, data ambiguity, and uh, problems of parameterization that the model wants, and you, don't, you, do not, you do not have data to do so. So there is a problem of using purely physical models, and there is a problem in using purely statistical models. So my experience, I would say that the best that we have found so far is to use a hybrid approach. To take the good part of the physics, okay, and this good part of the physics provide the, the statistical models with features, you know, features for the machine learning that has the physics inside. So instead of giving the, phys the machine learning just the precipitation, the raw data of precipitation, you provide something like discharge or other variables that have, that comes from the physics and have the mass conservations inside. And so the machine learning then is much more able to provide good accuracy. Yes, thanks very much. I uh, I was hoping exactly for this kind of answer that we should not uh, forget physics, but still uh, we can use machine learning at least as a complementary approach yes. and the hybrid might be the solution. So if there are no more questions, oh, Honza is asking, okay, we have a question. It will be in English, right? No problem. Yes. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'd like to ask you, uh, you mentioned 
uh, about Sentinel-1 and 2 and detection of uh, uh, dry or wet surfaces, do you use any other data from satellites, from remote sensing? Yes, thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, we use the, the, the remote sensing for the snow cover. The snow covered area are detected by, <clears throat> we use essentially Sentinel-2, like, uh, 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 let's say, um, um, uh, the, um, the the satellite that that uh, uh, looks at the reflection of the of the of the area, so the optical sensors, and then uh, but the, the snow covered area is part of the story because we are interested in the snow water equivalent, so the snow water equivalent must be somehow at least in our in our case must be considered using the physics again. So we have a model that does mass conservation and energy conservation for the snow. And then we use the Sentinel-2, the optical sensor, to, let's say, assimilate the snow covered area inside the physical models. Another thing that we are doing now, which is not yet operational, but we are starting to do, is to assimilate soil moisture from the satellite so that uh, the satellite can give you an updated initial condition of the catchment when you want to start the simulation for the forecast. So I would say that uh, snow covered area and soil moisture could be the variables in, high, uh, in, the, in the hydrology that can be assimilated through remote sensing.